Good afternoon, everyone. We have our, our next speaker coming up, and it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce my friend John Bolton. Uh, if you guys could settle, it would be great. Um, I served with John Bolton at the United Nations, and in a relatively short time, John distinguished himself as the force of nature that everyone has come to know and, and understand John. Um, I know John is a friend and somebody I've looked up to for, for many years, and um, there's no smarter, more uh, uh, compelling patriot in the United States. He cares very deeply um, about the things that he advocates in policy. And I, I brought my glasses, uh, and I have your bio, John, because I didn't realize, you know, I remembered this, but I want to go over the jobs that you had. It shows that you're experienced and old, um, but the, um, so other than serving as the perm rep, I think most of you know that he was the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, which is sort of the arms control and proliferation expert at the State Department. But he was also Assistant Attorney General, Secretary for International Organizations in the State Department, Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice in 1985, Assistant Administrator for Program and Policy Coordination at the USAID, he was the general counsel of USAID in the 1980s. And what it speaks to, the reason why it was important to go over these things, is that John has an incredible depth of experience, understanding, and knowledge of policy and government and the way it works. And that's formed his opinions. And um, he throws out opinions that are well thought through and constructed, sometimes controversial, but always impassioned and an great, great patriot. And um, one of my great pleasures in life, with, as I said earlier, is getting to work with many people. And John Bolton fits squarely within that. So it's my pleasure to introduce my friend John Bolton, who I promise you is going to be uh, provocative, if nothing else, OK? <laughs> Well, thanks very much, Mark. I think uh, it's uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to, well, pleasure to welcome all of you. Mark has done a fantastic job uh, since basically creating Yuani and uh, bringing attention to uh, uh, many, many of Iran's misdeeds, uh, uh, both in the nuclear program itself and the economic support that it is uh, unfortunately received over the years from the West, from people who ought to know better than to deal with this uh, largest uh, financier of uh, terrorism in the world, as well as uh, one of the principal rogue states seeking uh, nuclear weapons. So this conference uh, today at the opening of the UN General Assembly is especially well-timed, and it's uh, really a pleasure to participate in it. Now, I know you've been conferencing most of the day, so uh, perhaps you didn't have a chance to watch uh, the President's speech to the General Assembly this morning. He talked about uh, many, uh, many things, but in particular, he talked about uh, Iran and North Korea, which is my topic today. And I don't know how to explain this, but by an unfortunate coincidence, the President delivered my speech this morning. <laughs> so, so I'm going to have to... Uh, I'm going to have to improvise here a little bit, but I do think that uh, uh, this connection, uh, this relationship between Iran and North Korea, their nuclear programs, their ballistic missile programs, uh, is incredibly important. Uh, I think it's something that, unfortunately, the uh, mass media, uh, uh, the mainstream media in particular, which too often have the attention span of a fruit fly, uh, don't understand uh, and don't uh, fully appreciate the implications of a relationship that goes back a long way. So I'd like to just start with a little bit of history uh, about the Iranian and uh, North Korean programs uh, and why it's my view, uh, based on what I can uh, talk about in public from my time in the government, uh, my very strong view that what uh, President George W. Bush called an axis of evil after the 9-11 attacks is more than simply a metaphor. Uh, in the case of Iran and North Korea, I think it's very real. And uh, it, it, uh, what we know, and uh, I will underline uh, at the outset that there's a lot we don't know, but what we do know uh, is pretty frightening. 
Uh, let me start on the ballistic missile side. North Korea uh, essentially sold Iran its first Scud missiles more than 25 years ago. Uh, and from that time forward, both North Korea and Iran based the bulk of the development of their missile programs on Soviet-era Scud missile technology. Now, the course of this development was uneven. Sometimes it progressed rapidly. Sometimes years went by without significant testing. Uh, it's hard to explain, in the case of North Korea in particular, what factors may have uh, provoked decisions uh, to, for the pace of the development of the missile program. There's a lot we don't know. Um, but it's clear from the history, both with respect to Iran and North Korea, that the purpose of uh, the missile programs was to deliver uh, payloads on targets on Earth. It was not to launch weather satellites or communication satellites. Ultimately, it was to have a capability to deliver nuclear warheads in particular. So this, uh, during the 1990s, after this first contact, uh, the, the two countries, uh, you know, I think proceeded more, more or less on their own, some, some contact back and forth. But then in 1998, there was a very significant development when North Korea uh, launched a missile from one of its uh, uh, launch sites on the peninsula that uh, traveled east across Japan and landed in the Pacific Ocean uh, uh, several hundred miles from the eastern shores of the main Japanese islands. Now, we've just seen in the past couple months the kind of reaction you can get in Japan when a North Korean missile overflies Jap Japanese territory. This was the first time it happened in 1998, and the reaction in uh, uh, Japan was white hot because everybody understood that if the North Koreans could land a missile east of Japan, they could land it on Japan. And so intense was the uh, Japanese reaction that the North Koreans uh, voluntarily agreed to a moratorium on launch testing from the Korean Peninsula. Uh, they continued to do what's called static testing, that is to say testing rocket motors that are tied to launch platforms. Uh, but effectively, they transferred all of their launch testing activities to Iran. Uh, they shared telemetry, they shared experiences, and this went on uh, for almost exactly uh, eight years. And I can tell you to the day when North Korea uh, ceased the moratorium on launch testing, it was July the 4th, 2006. Uh, I remember it well because I was up here, and this was yet another holiday that some rogue state had ruined for me, uh, because obviously the uh, testing of, uh, of this ballistic missile followed a number of activities in connection with North Korea's nuclear program, uh, throwing out IAEA inspectors in 2001, actually withdrawing from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 2002, uh, our conclusion on uh, North Korea's continuing weapons-related activities. So the resumption of launch testing from the peninsula uh, meant that North Korea had entered essentially a new phase uh, of its activities. And it's the, it was the kind of development that obviously got everybody's attention. Now, interestingly, just for historical purposes, of course, when I joined the State Department in the George W. Bush administration, I learned that one of the last things that the Clinton administration had been negotiating had been uh, a potential deal with North Korea where North Korea would have given up its missile program and we would have voluntarily launched weather and communication satellites for North Korea because, after all, that's what they said the purpose of it was. Uh, and if we had done that, we would have given them weather and communication satellites because they don't have any, and they would have continued their launch testing activities with Iran, with, with whom they had so much experience. Now, who was negotiating that deal right at the end of the Clinton administration? Wendy Sherman. Keep that name in mind. We'll come back to it. So if you, if you look at what's happened in the past several years, uh, in terms of uh, Iranian-North Korean missile cooperation, 
uh, we've seen reports, particularly uh, with increasing frequency in the last 10 years since the North resumed missile testing uh, from, from the peninsula, of uh, delegations of Iranian scientists being present at key missile launches from the peninsula, delegations of Co North Korean scientists being present in Iran uh, at key events in connection with their missile program. Uh, we've seen the exchange of technologies uh, popping up first in one program, reappearing in the other. And we've seen the continuing problem from an intelligence point of view of trying to figure out how and under what circumstances North Korea and Iran were able to make this kind of progress, particularly in the case of North Korea, one of the world's poorest societies, effectively a 25 million person prison camp. Uh, and I think this question has particular force in the last six months. Uh, where uh, the North's missile progress has surprised uh, even the most pessimistic observers of North Korea's capabilities, pessimistic in the sense of worried about how advanced they were, raising the question of how uh, this, uh, the, these technological advances proceeded at such a rapid pace. Are they getting more aid from China? Are they getting more aid from Russia? Where is this coming from? Uh, now, some people think that it's uh, Iran aiding North Korea. Others think it's North Korea aiding Iran. I think the case is much clearer that these two countries have been working on ballistic missiles, science, and technology uh, for nearly a quarter of a century. There's much that we don't know, but I do believe that the recent progress of North Korea uh, is something they couldn't have gotten uh, entirely on their own. And I think that uh, we will see at some point even more evidence of that. But uh, although Iran has not launched missiles capable of the range that North Korea has, uh, my guess is, as with the nuclear program, uh, as I've said uh, uh, er, er, in earlier commentary, whatever North Korea has today, Iran can have tomorrow by writing a check of the right amount. And uh, do I have intelligence that proves that? No. What I have is this. North Korea is a poor country. Iran has a lot of liquid assets, you know, $150 billion unfrozen thanks to the nuclear deal, substantial new European uh, investment and trade in a whole variety of areas. Uh, let me get this straight. You have rich buyer and poor seller. H how does that work exactly? This is not hard to understand. And unfortunately, what you've got on the missile side, I believe, although I will uh, readily admit I have less evidence uh, of it, but I believe it's true on the nuclear side as well. And the reason is, given the commonality of purpose of the missile program, it would defy credulity not to think that they were cooperating on the nuclear side as well. We do have some evidence of what uh, that cooperation, uh, how that cooperation has manifested itself. Uh, we know, for example, uh, because we made this public during the Bush administration when we collapsed the AQ Khan proliferation network, that AQ Khan, known as the founder of the Pakistani nuclear program, was selling technology for uranium enrichment that he had stolen from the European uranium enrichment company, Urenco. He had taken it back to Pakistan. He had built Pakistan's uranium enrichment facilities based on the designs and what he carried away in his head. And he sold that to three countries that we know of, Iran, uh, North Korea, and Libya. I like to think of him as a... Um, non-discriminatory uh, nuclear proliferator. He'd sell to anybody uh, who had the money, Sunni, Shia, uh, North Korean, whatever. Uh, he may have sold this technology to others. We don't know. Uh, but he certainly sold the basic uranium enrichment uh, technology sometime in the 1990s. We know also that he sold weapons designs, uh, probably to the same three countries. Uh, and we have the weapons designs that he sold to Libya because we got them back from Gaddafi in early 2004. Uh, these two Khan took from Pakistan. Uh, and we know this because the weapons designs are filled with Chinese characters. And why not? Where did Pakistan get its nuclear weapons design from, from China? So the odds of uh, North Korea and Iran using that same uh, blueprint, literally, 
for nuclear weapons that Pakistan used, and North Korea in particular, having the possibility of Chinese scientists and engineers coming to show how they improve those designs over the years seems to me to be uh, quite high. Uh, we also know that China and Iran have uh, worked in parallel tracks over the years in the West to procure uh, technology, materials, and machines that they need for both their ballistic missile and nuclear programs, sometimes called dual-use equipment. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and this is something that they've traded information on, and we believe through their scientists and engineers that uh, that's been fairly extensive. And how do they do that in the West? I was just in Ukraine last week and spoke with a former head of Ukrainian intelligence uh, post the Euromaidan overthrow of uh, the Yanukovych government, and he described uh, to me how it worked like this. North Korean or Iranian agents would come to Ukraine to purchase a high-tech uh, welding machine, which you need for sophisticated uh, uh, welding of, uh, particularly of, of ballistic missile components. Uh, and they would arrange to buy it in the name of a Belarusian company. So the Ukrainian seller doesn't sell it to North Korea or Iran, they sell it to a company in Belarus. And the equipment may or may not go to Belarus, but then from Belarus, after transactions inside that country that make it completely confusing where uh, the ownership lies, it then suddenly finds itself in Iran or North Korea. And this is a pattern that's duplicated really uh, all over Europe. So what North Korea did in the nuclear field uh, after signing the so-called agreed framework with the Clinton administration, where they pledged, as they have multiple times in the past 25 years, to give up uh, any aspirations for nuclear weapons, uh, they began to purchase in Europe what, uh, what one of the analysts at the CIA described to me at the time is like a shopping list of everything you need for a sophisticated uranium enrichment program, uh, which they then put together uh, at uh, underground facilities in North Korea. The North Koreans use the agreed framework to extract material concessions from the United States, South Korea, and Japan in exchange for a promise to give up the pursuit of nuclear weapons. They were to receive substantial shipments of heavy fuel oil. That was to make up for the loss of power that the nuclear reactor that they had operating would no longer be able to supply. And I just, as a footnote, mentioned that the North Korean reactor has never been tied into what we laughingly refer to as North Korea's power grid. But we, we agreed to provide them with heavy fuel oil and, uh, even more unbelievably, to build two light water reactors for North Korea. As somebody once said to me, this is like the uh, scotch drinker who goes to Alcoholics Anonymous and says, I'm going to give up. I'm only going to drink beer. Uh, you know, they're more proliferation resistant than heavy water reactors, but you can still get plutonium out of the spent fuel to reprocess into nuclear weapons. Uh, and this continued until 2002 when, uh, under the Bush administration, our negotiators confronted North Korea with the evidence we had of how they were violating their commitments, uh, and the North Koreans admitted it. So they have provided the pattern, they've provided the technique of how to gull, gull, take the gullibility of the West to their advantage to continue their nuclear weapons program uh, uh, covertly while benefiting uh, from uh, the, uh, the technology that they're able to procure uh, in Western markets. And what we saw with North Korea, uh, as I said before, throwing out IAEA inspectors, then withdrawing from the Non-Proliferation Treaty, led them to their first nuclear test in 2006. Uh, the West uh, and Japan and South Korea tried for uh, for this entire period of 25 years, this what the State Department they called carrots and sticks, a mix of incentives and disincentives through diplomacy, through sanctions to get North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons ambitions. North Koreans pledged multiple times to do that, and they lied every time. This is essentially the same pattern of negotiation we used with Iran. Uh, and in both cases, it missed the key point that if the would-be nuclear power state is determined to get 
deliverable nuclear weapons. The longer you negotiate with them, the more time you're providing them to achieve the objectives uh, that they really want. Negotiation is not cost-free. Like any other human activity that uh, involves time, there are costs to it. And in proliferation scenarios, time is not a neutral uh, asset. It's an asset that the proliferator needs uh, considerably more than uh, than, the, uh, uh, the, than the countries trying to stop them from proliferating. So all this activity is going on in North Korea, and where is it going on? Primarily, it's going on in underground locations, because the North Koreans learned uh, years ago that to prevent the United States and its allies from really understanding much about what was happening, you had to do it underground. Uh, and indeed, it's often been said, I'm not counting basements here, but it's often been said there are more underground structures in North Korea than there are in the entire United States. So this is also a lesson that Iran learned, that uh, they saw what had happened uh, to Saddam Hussein in 1981 when Israel destroyed the Osirak reactor, the Osirak nuclear reactor outside of Baghdad, uh, setting back Iraq's nuclear activities a considerable amount, Iran learned that you're not going to do uh, that sort of activity any place that, uh, that Israel can find it. Uh, and so we come to September of 2007, when Israel destroys a reactor being built in the Syrian desert. Uh, this was something Israel's intelligence had uncovered. The United States intelligence agencies had not found it. Israel came to the United States in the spring of 2007 and said, we have evidence there's a nuclear reactor being built in Syria, and we're going to destroy it. Uh, the Bush administration said, uh, well, show us, prove to us it's a reactor and don't destroy it yet, please. So Israel brought the evidence, there's no ambiguity what it was, and uh, said, we'll wait until the end of the summer before we act. So they waited till September, the Bush administration was still considering what to do, and Israel destroyed it. Now, this reactor, as we can see from sub subsequent overhead imagery, was basically a duplicate of North Korea's reactor at Yongbyon. Uh, and we have learned from the original Israeli intelligence and other sources as well that it was being built under the supervision uh, uh, of North Korean scientists and using many North Korean workers. Now, why is North Korea building a nuclear reactor uh, in the middle of the Syrian desert? Is it because of their long historical and close cultural relationships? Uh, is it because North Korea has a humanitarian bent to it and did it for fun? No, of course not. Somebody's paying the North Koreans to build this reactor. Uh, so there are two possibilities. One is that it's Syria. The other is that it's Iran. Now, I have a, just a brief personal story to tell here. Uh, I got into uh, uh, considerable controversy uh, when I was Under Secretary of State for Arms Control in two testimonies that I gave, one that was classified, one unclassified, on Syrian interest in weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and I won't talk about what I said in the classified session, but on the unclassified session, I talked about uh, Syria's interest in nuclear technology that would facilitate the construction of nuclear weapons. Uh, then Senator Joe Biden reacted with dismay that anybody could think Syria was interested in nuclear weapons. Uh, he, he just, it was inconceivable, but his clinching argument was that uh, it was impossible that Syria was uh, involved in the construction of that reactor because they simply didn't ha have the assets to pay for it. So since we all agreed North Korea doesn't do anything for free, obviously you couldn't say it was Syria because they couldn't afford it. Well, where did the money come from? I think it came from Iran. I don't have evidence of that other than I have heard from Syrian exiles, former Syrian officials, that that was what was commonly believed in Damascus, but it makes sense. If you want to conduct your illicit nuclear activities in a way that protects you from an Israeli strike, why not conduct them in a place you think nobody is looking? Uh, now, obviously, Israel found that place and destroyed it. So my guess is that it's entirely possible that Iran's 
a considerable part of Iran's real uranium enrichment program is under a mountain in North Korea. Again, there's a buyer-seller dynamic here that makes perfectly good sense. It could have been that reactor in Syria was a three-way joint venture, Syria providing the territory, Iran providing the financing, uh, North Korea providing the uh, design and construction. All of this says to me that the uh, subsequent press accounts, again, very parallel, uh, Iranian scientists in attendance at uh, North Korean nuclear tests, uh, exchange of information, uh, questions about Chinese and Russian involvement uh, right down to the present day, uh, all tie together. Uh, and so I think that uh, today, with the crisis uh, that we face with North Korea, uh, it's time to stop, it's long since past time to stop this uh, keeping the North Korean and Iranian nuclear weapons programs in separate silos. And this is a phenomenon of the structure of the State Department, the intelligence agencies, the military in part. You have your Middle East experts over here, they know all about Iran. You have your Far East experts over here, they know all about North Korea. They might as well be in different buildings for all that they talk to each other. So I think there's a considerable amount of work we have to do uh, looking at our intelligence, trying to get new intelligence, considering what this linkage is. Because if it turns out to be uh, as robust as is uh, entirely possible, debates about the uh, uh, Obama nuclear deal with Iran uh, are kind of secondary. If North Korea gets any further, uh, Iran will have essentially everything that North Korea has, or at least have it uh, on a good option price for the day they want it. So that brings me to the President's speech, and I think really to the question, what should be our objective in dealing with the North Korean and Iranian nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs? As I've said, in both cases, with variations and different emphases, but in both, in both uh, situations, for nearly 25 years, we have tried uh, persuasion, we have tried coercion, we have tried to convince them that uh, they're uh, putting themselves in danger by continuing these nuclear weapons programs. We have failed utterly. I mean, come on, let's be honest. We've tried for 25 years, and we are at the end of the road. Susan Rice, Barack Obama's national security advisor, at least had the self-respect to write an op-ed in the New York Times a few weeks ago where she said, basically, we've failed. So now we have to accept North Korea with nuclear weapons. Uh, we did it during the Cold War, she said happily. Uh, we'll just have containment and deterrence and everything will be fine. Which I have to say uh, gives the lie to what uh, many people have said for years, oh yes, we don't want North Korea with nuclear weapons, we don't want Iran with nuclear weapons. I don't think they were serious or at least they weren't very serious, because now that it is almost upon us, they're perfectly relaxed about it. Uh, this uh, analogy to uh, the Cold War bipolar standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union is dangerous and badly misplaced. Number one, who here in this room wants to go back to those happy days of duck and cover drills in your elementary school. Remember that? Maybe Susan's not old enough, I don't know. Uh, but it was a dangerous period in our history. We narrowly missed a potentially civilization-ending exchange of nuclear salvos on several occasions with the Soviet Union. We made it through, but as much by good fortune and the grace of God as anything else willingly to submit to that, I just, I, it's, it leaves me uh, speechless. But even more important, the analogy fails on many, many uh, respects. Uh, the idea that the mental calculus, I use that term advisedly, of Kim Jong-un and his regime is anything like the mental calculus of the Soviet Union is wide of the remark. And I would make the same point about the religious extremists running the regime in Tehran. Uh, we developed the, uh, the deterrence theory with the Soviets over an extended period of time, uh, and we're just lucky it didn't uh, break down earlier. 
but the notion that they fit immediately into that same mental calculus is just wrong, number one. Number two, the Russians at least at some point recognized that further proliferation of their nuclear capabilities endangered them just as much as it endangered us. That's not the view of the Ayatollahs and the Kim Jong-un regime. North Korea would sell anything to anybody, and the possibility that Iran would give a nuclear device to a terrorist group, not requiring delivery by ballistic missile, I think is real. So the mere possession of these capabilities uh, m makes them markedly different from Cold War days. And finally, uh, during the Cold War, uh, we were in essentially a bipolar uh, standoff. Uh, that's how theories of containment and deterrence were developed. If Iran and North Korea get nuclear weapons, much more significantly than uh, Pakistan and India, certainly much more than Israel, you are then in a multipolar nuclear world where every incentive is for further proliferation and more countries to get a nuclear capability. Anybody who tells you that they understand how a multipolar nuclear world would function is smoking something. Because we've never lived in a multipolar nuclear world. And I, for one, don't want to find out. So I think the answer here is coming down very quickly to the question, are you prepared to see North Korea or Iran keep a nuclear weapons and ballistic missile capability? Because once you say that, then you are into containment and deterrence. And we are at risk uh, as far as the eye can see. My view is uh, the view of Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dunford, was asked at Aspen six or eight weeks ago, oh, General, don't you find it unimaginable that anybody could see a military answer to the North Korean problem? And I would say the same on Iran. And Dunford said, no, I don't find it unimaginable. We're developing uh, those plans right now. He said, what I find unimaginable is leaving North Korea with a nuclear capability. That is my view as well. And that is the decision that uh, the Trump administration and all of us as American citizens uh, are going to have to come to, I think, much more quickly uh, than we know. Thank you very much. So, so uh, I, I, I know I'm the only thing standing between you and Chris Christie, but, but I am not deterred by that. I am happy to answer questions, and I think uh, Mark, Mark is supposed to come up here and ask me questions. So. I think what we did is we've arranged uh, the cards that we talked about before, and it looks like there are a lot of questions. So uh, if you have questions, filter the cards in, and we'll start with the, the questions. Yes, yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free um, to fill out. Uh, We'll come around and grab them, but we have a few. So one of the questions is, if we manage to get out of the nuclear Iran deal, what happens next? How do we realistically prevent nuclear development? Right. Well, I think uh, uh, the president uh, uh, certainly spoke in strong terms this morning uh, about his feelings on the Iran nuclear deal. They, uh, his view of it hasn't improved in the past couple of months. Uh, I don't know what he's going to do. I think it's clear that there's no grounds uh, under the uh, existing legislation to certify that this deal is in the national interest of the United States. I think it's uh, the worst uh, uh, diplomatic debacle in our history. Uh, I think there are clear Iranian violations. I think the violations demonstrate a pattern of pushing the envelope. Uh, and the violations obviously only cover what the IAEA can find out. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of the IAEA, but it's not an intelligence agency. The IAEA monitors the non-diversion of nuclear materials from declared nuclear sites and the various tasks uh, given it under the uh, Iran deal. Uh, it has not been able to monitor ever, uh, but certainly not in the last two plus years, military facilities in Iran. Well, where do you think the nuclear weapons program is? 
Honestly, if it's not in North Korea, it's in places where the IAEA isn't monitoring. But having once not certified by mid-October, the president has a subsequent decision whether to pull out of the deal entirely. I think he should. I think we should abrogate the deal. I think the argument that you don't certify but stay in is a kind of one shoe on, one shoe off foreign policy. It may suit a five-year-old. It doesn't suit the United States. Uh, we have a very difficult task in front of us. We need to lead with political and moral clarity. And I'd get out of the deal and I'd say to the Europeans, uh, th this is something the United States is not able to accept. Uh, we're going to reimpose all the sanctions that we had before. You should do the same. Uh, and as you can see, because by this time it's now three or four months down the road, events may have happened in North Korea uh, that uh, we're determined that Iran is not going to uh, uh, end here with a nuclear capability. Just to follow up on that point as well, um, how do we nurture that political will amongst uh, folks in Europe and others um, to make that the way forward? Yeah, look, this, this, this Iran nuclear deal is an incredibly cynical uh, uh, agreement. Iran knew, and so did Barack Obama, that it was front end loaded that the obligations of the West came first, and the obligations of Iran, which were trivial and easily reversible to begin with, came at the end. So the intention was to ensnare Europe and the United States in commercial relationships uh, with Iran that would make it painful, too painful, to pull out of. Uh, and that's what the Europeans are reflecting. They understand that uh, although many deals have been made in the past two years, if we get out of the deal, all bets are off. Uh, so, of course, they don't want to get out of the deal. I mean, if, 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 uh, if uh, Vladimir Lenin hadn't said, we will, uh, the capitalists will sell us the rope that we hang them with, you could, the Ayatollahs would have come up with it. Uh, but the fact is, when the United States withdraws, we create a new reality and the Europeans will adopt to that. It will take considerable diplomacy, uh, but that's what the State Department is for. It's not an argument when you say the Europeans are opposed to this, therefore we don't do it. The argument is the Europeans are opposed to this, therefore we've got a lot of work to do, but we're gonna do it anyway. Thank you. Um, next question on this topic. To what extent did Boeing influence the previous administration policy towards Iran and the nuclear deal? Look, I think every American company, maybe including some of our oil companies, uh, saw economic possibilities in Iran. Uh, I mean, let's not forget, it's not so long ago, pre-1979 Islamic Revolution, when American companies did enormous amounts of business with uh, the Shah's Iran. Uh, and the prospect of holding back while the Europeans got there first was more than their competitive instincts could tolerate. So I think a lot of companies uh, were prepared to be bought off. I think this is a problem, honestly, to come to North Korea, because I, I see these questions as so interrelated. When people say, we've got to apply more economic pressure on China to get them to apply economic pressure on North Korea, it's not going to work. Uh, because to impose pain on North Korea, uh, sorry, on China, requires bearing a certain amount of pain ourselves. That's what happens when you deny economic transactions. And I tell you, American business is not into pain. Moving on to an another question. Um, can you please provide a thumbnail review of Russia's short and long-term interests in connection with the North Korea-Iran nexus? Well, Russia uh, obviously is profoundly interested in both. Uh, uh, I'll just take Asia, and this is, this is I'm going to shorten this in the interest of time so it, it won't be terribly subtle, but here's Russia's problem in Asia. It's got a big empty spaces with very few people in it, with lots of minerals under the ground. To, to its south are, uh, is a big populous country without a lot of natural resources, but with a well-developed military. So Russia's got real problems in Asia in the rest of this century. And I would predict by the end of the century, I'm not sure that Russian Far East Asia will be part of Russia anymore. It may well be part of China. So its play in North Korea is a balance of power play against China. 
Uh, that's what it, its interest is, as well as selling uh, oil and other resources and getting a heftier trade relationship with South Korea, which it would like. On Iran, <clears throat> the interests are uh, economic in many respects. They are both oil and gas producing countries. Uh, I sometimes think that Russia longs for the possibility of joining OPEC so they can really squeeze the purchasers of oil and natural gas. Thank God for fracking in this country. Um, uh, Russia would love to sell sophisticated weapons to uh, Iran, and it is. It recently finally consummated the transaction of the S-300 air defense system, which is a very, very advanced uh, uh, air defense system that uh, is it probably uh, uh, can probably can stop any aircraft attack other than stealth aircraft, which uh, which can put a constraint on a number of countries. So the commercial and political relationships are real, and I think the political relationship you can see playing out now uh, in the Middle East is ISIS uh, nears collapse, uh, and Iran, with Russian help, is creating the linkage, uh, the arc of control from Iran through the. Uh, area controlled by the Iraqi government in Baghdad, which is effectively a satellite of Iran through Assad, Syria, to Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, anchored by the new Russian air base at Latakia. So effectively, Russia and Iran function as allies in the Middle East. They have economic relationships. Uh, and uh, it gives the lie, by the way, to the argument that the Russians can join with us in the war against terrorism because Iran is obviously the central banker of international terrorism, uh, not the same kind as ISIS or al-Qaeda uh, or Taliban, but terrorist, really, the, the first terrorist revolution in the Islamic world in 1979. Uh, another question that, we came, that came in, if Iran can purchase weapons from North Korea, how would future arms control agreements account for um, such easy technology transfers? In other words, is arms control dead? Well, you know, I, uh, for my sins, I've done a lot of arms control over the years, and it's never been terribly successful. You know, Winston Churchill said back in the 1920s when naval arms control was the big uh, objective of international negotiations, really the only people that you uh, can have confidence that, that will honor arms control agreements are precisely the countries you don't worry about having arms control agreements with. And that was true 100 years ago, and it's true today, too. Monitoring and verification are very hard. The uh, Iran deal's verification provisions are utterly inadequate. There is no international verification in North Korea, and our intelligence there is, uh, is woefully inadequate. Very good. Um, does um, the Kim Jong-un regime lack of regard for the suffering um, of its people indicate that it's essentially impervious to sanctions? Well, that's, uh, that's an important point. And I think one, uh, actually, that's not well understood, and it applies not just to uh, uh, North Korea, it applies to Iran, uh, it applies to Russia and the sanctions it currently uh, faces because of its annexation of the Crimea uh, and its involvement in the Donbass region of Ukraine. Uh, these are not regimes that care about the economic well-being of their people anywhere near what the United States and Western democracies care about it. North Korea happens to be the most profound example. It's really, it's a 25 million person prison camp. In the mid-1990s, uh, the poverty and the famine were so great that North Korean cities were depopulating. People were leaving to go, with, go live with relatives in the country. You can't eat asphalt. Uh, but out in the country, at least, there's some prospect now. Things have improved since then. But the fact is that it's a very primitive economy. And I think uh, the most significant sanctions that the United States uh, really has ever imposed on anybody, those against Iraq in 1990 through the UN after Saddam Hussein inv invaded Kuwait, prove the point. We, we cut off, uh, we tried to cut off Iraq's oil shipments. Uh, and hope that that would pressure them to withdraw from Kuwait. Uh, in the meantime, our close allies, Turkey and Jordan, are buying oil from Iraq just like nothing had ever happened. They're getting it out through Iran, despite the fact that they're still technically engaged in hostilities. Uh, the sanctions didn't work. They would never have persuaded Saddam Hussein to withdraw from Kuwait. Sanctions, I think, can work in certain limited circumstances. Uh, 
uh, but but not in they have not certainly not worked in the case of uh, of Iran or North Korea for 25 years. There's no prospect they'll work in year 26. Uh one final question. Um, can you compare the current administration's response to Russia in regards to its relationship uh, to Iran and North Korea to the previous administration? Well, I think right now the rhetorical difference is extraordinary. And uh, the president uh, in the speech today, and I encourage all of you to listen to it uh, or read the transcript, particularly on Iran and North Korea, could not have been more clear. Uh, the issue is whether the rest of his government feels the same way. Uh, and I'll just give you one example. On Sunday, Secretary Tillerson said that, uh, that uh, he described our policy toward North Korea, and he said the objective uh, is to get uh, North Korea back to the table uh, for what he called constructive, uh, constructive, productive dialogue. Now, we've had constructive, productive dialogue with North Korea for 25 years. It doesn't work. That's the wrong policy. And yesterday, by contrast, Prime Minister Abe of Japan wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. Many of you may have seen it. It's well worth reading if, if you missed it. Uh, 24 hours after our Secretary of State said he wanted constructive, productive dialogue, Abe said, and I quote, more dialogue with North Korea would be a dead end. And he's absolutely right. And Abe, and this is significant, then went on to say that he reaffirmed the ironclad Japan-U.S. alliance. He said, Japan is in lockstep with the United States. And he then said, I firmly support the U.S. position that all options are on the table. So, you know, that's about as clear a statement as a uh, low-key diplomatic Japanese prime minister is ever going to make that if the United States attacks, Japan will be with us. You know, that, if there were any chance of avoiding military hostilities, would be because that's what North Korea and China felt certain would be about to happen. So we'll see over the next several months, and obviously what happens in the case of North Korea, and I think that uh, is the leading edge here, will have a dramatic impact on Iran, too. Um, one more question that we have. Um, earlier, we had a question about Boeing doing business with Iran, but what do you have to say generally about, uh, to companies who sort of rush to do business with Iran following um, the Iran deal agreement? Look, why you would want to do business with a state sponsor of terrorism is beyond me. Uh, you know, I think, I think this is one of Yuani's most significant contributions. Uh, the work that Mark and all of his people have done uh, to explain to companies just how dangerous this is for our country and for our friends around the world. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a shareholder, I mean, I'm a modest shareholder <laughs> in, in every case, but, uh, and I, I certainly hope my pension funds are maximizing their return on investment and all that, but good God, can't they do it by doing business with somebody other than countries like Iran or North Korea? Listen, thank you very much. Thanks for your support for Ioana. Good luck to you.